Welcome to Animals Matter. I'm Alyssa Weaver, your host for today's program. Animals Matter covers a variety of current issues affecting pets, livestock, wildlife, and other animals. We aim to highlight the great work of individuals and organizations making a difference for animals. This program will look at wildlife management and predators in particular in the U.S. and Oregon, its historical current state, and the need for change based on the latest research available. In particular, we'll look at predator behavior and the current federal and state policies that annually exterminate millions of native animals and address whether coexistence can be achieved. We'll have the perspective of two prominent individuals respected in their fields and who have made contributions to this field of knowledge from both a research and advocacy point of view. Dr. Gay Bradshaw is an internationally known expert on elephant, Amazon parrot, and grizzly bear psychology and the traumatic effects from human violence on these and other wildlife species. She is the founder and director and of the nonprofit The Carullo Center and author of Elephants on the Edge and Carnivore Minds, Who These Fearsome Animals Really Are, both published by the Yale University Press. She holds doctorate degrees in ecology and psychology and is a native Oregonian living here in the Applegate Valley. Welcome, Gay. Scott Beckstead is the Rural Affairs Director and former Oregon State Director of the Humane Society of the United States. In addition to his work with the HSUS, Scott holds a law degree and teaches animal law classes at Willamette University. And he has co-authored the first case book on animal law in 2000. He lives with his family in Sutherland, Oregon. Welcome, Scott. Thank you. Happy to be here. Gay, you're the executive director of the Karulus Center, a nonprofit organization dedicated to ethical living with non-human nature. And you're also credited with the groundbreaking discovery of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, in free-living elephants, and that your work there launched the field of trans-species psychology. Can you define trans-species psychology and tell us more about the Karulis Center? Uh, yes, trans-species psychology formally is the study of animal minds, um, brains, minds, emotions, and that includes humans. And essentially what trans-species psychology is, is really the recognition of the entire corpus of science, which uh, runs on a unitary model, a single model of how the mind and the brain functions, and that includes humans. So when we're thinking about a grizzly bear, when we're thinking about a fish, when we're thinking about a bird um, or a human, basically all of science says we have the same structures and processes that govern and have the capa capacities that we do for thinking, emotions, dreamings, aspirations. Mm -hmm. And so how has that colored how you have analyzed uh, wildlife and, um, and wildlife management? Well, it really sort of turns the myth on its head. Um, most of, I'll focus on carnivores, I prefer that term to predators because predators really carries a lot of negative baggage on it, um, like these evil creatures, etc. But really it's saying that these are thinking, feeling individuals just like we are. And so um, when you look from a psychological perspective, you're no longer objectifying, you're no longer saying this, you know, this bear here and we're over here, we're really part of the same community. So it really shifts it, and it also really um, underscores the um, uh, seriousness of the current ways of uh, humans interacting with carnivores. Um, again, you brought up the PTSD with elephants. It's the same thing with grizzly bears and coyotes, um, golden eagles, crocodiles, rattlesnakes, this onslaught of continuing violence, which ranges from hunting to poaching to lethal um, other ways of, of killing um, is essentially this incredible repeated trauma. Mm -hmm. And so what you're really doing from a very rigorous scientific perspective is we are changing the minds and the brains of the bodies of these individuals, just as we would see in a human who has um, experienced genocide or war. And are we doing this um, 
generationally, meaning are, is, is this affecting the animals to where the you know, subsequent generations mm -hmm. of them, it's changing their behavior yes. as well? Yeah, there's an entire field in science called epigenetics and that really describes the fact that um, when we have successive generations, the genes are passed down, but the experiences, in other words, what an individual experiences, whether it's a pregnant mother or it, it's, a, it's a baby, that that experience interacts with the genetics and makes a change, and that gets passed down through generations. So we are seeing changes in wildlife, just like we did in elephants. We're seeing the changes in uh, wildlife and carnivores here elsewhere. I know that when I was um, in Louisiana a few years ago, we were on a houseboat, and my husband had asked the folks there, do we need to watch out for alligators? Mm -hmm. And they said, they won't come near humans because we hunt them, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So aggressively, they know not to come near humans, you mm -hmm. know, so it has changed their behavior mm -hmm. as well. Tell us a little bit about the Carulla Center. What do you do there, and um, where is it? Because I think it's <laughs> a lot of places, isn't it? Well, we are locally based here in, in the Applegate, but we do a lot of international work. Um, we have a small sanctuary which takes in endangered special needs. They have an arm or a leg missing um, endangered desert tortoises and rabbits, so we're the tortoise in the hare sanctuary. Um, we basically have three functions. We do research, education, and sanctuary. And essentially what we're doing is really um, using um, very, like I said, very conservative, very rigorous science, which is neuropsychology, and infusing that into um, policy, and law, and education. And how do people connect with the Karula Center if they're in another country on another continent? We have a lot of um, uh, internships. We have courses uh, that people can participate in. We're going to be expanding here locally so we can have on-site types of, of programs as well. But we work around the world. We have students from England, from Africa, and Asia. And what does Karulas mean? Karulas actually, uh, everyone thinks it's a kind of a strange name. It, it's actually the classical Greek word for kingfisher. And the reason I chose it was because uh, in classical Greek, Karulos means the kingfisher, which is bright cerulean blue, Karulos and cerulean. So bird and word are the same, which means we basically have eliminated the and between humans and nature. Nice, very nice, mm -hmm. and I will be pronouncing that correctly by the end of the program. So <laughs> say it enough, right? <laughs> <laughs> Carulo Center, Scott. We have a short video clip to show, which is going to introduce you and the Humane Society of the U.S. Let's take a look. Hi, I'm Scott Beckstead. I'm the Senior State Director for Oregon for the Humane Society of the United States. Every day, I get to work to help protect animals in our great state. I'm very proud of the fact that Oregon has some of the best laws in the nation for protecting animals. That's only possible because we are able to work very hard in the legislature of Oregon to make sure that we pass the best laws possible to make sure that animals get the protection that they deserve. Of course, there's still a lot of work to be done in Oregon. We're trying very hard to make sure that wildlife gets the protection that they need through sound and responsible wildlife management policies. We're trying very hard to stop abusive practices of all equines, including horse tripping that occurs at some rodeos in Eastern Oregon and other rodeo events that place animals at an unreasonable risk of harm. In Oregon, we have the Duchess Sanctuary, which is home to 186 formerly abused and neglected horses who now live a life of peace and luxury on 1,120 acres of horse paradise. None of the amazing progress that we've made in Oregon would be possible without your support. By working together, we can continue to make sure that Oregon is a strong national leader in protecting animals. Okay, so add something in regards to the work HSUS does for wildlife. Well, the Humane Society of the United States, um, we have sort of as our official mantra that we, uh, can, we celebrate animals and we confront cruelty. Uh, we work on the protection of all animal species from uh, dogs and cats to horses to farm animals, wildlife. Um, we work uh, nationally, uh, we work internationally through our global affiliate, the Humane Society International, and we work even at the local level uh, to help uh, pass ordinances to protect animals from cruelty. So, um, but my work here in Oregon, uh, a big part of what I have done over the past 10 years since coming to work for the, for the HSUS, really focuses on uh, native carnivores and, um, and part of, uh, a big part of what I've done is fight for uh, our native lion here in Oregon, the cougar. 
Uh, back in 1994, uh, Oregon voters passed Measure 18, which banned the use of dogs to hunt bears and cougars, and which banned the use of bait to hunt bears. And, ever, and I served as the campaign director mm. uh, for that campaign, and ever since then, I have been at the forefront fighting for the protection of cougars because unfortunately we have a legislature and an Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission and an Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife that is very hostile to our native carnivores. Bears, cougars, wolves, coyotes are all targeted by our wildlife managers uh, in a way that does not reflect the values of most Oregonians mm -hmm. who embrace these animals as members of uh, of our of our natural community, and so I go um, I, I go into the into the Oregon legislature, and I go before the Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission, and I fight for these native carnivores to protect them from the persecution that has really been the hallmark of how they have been treated both officially and by uh, people in various industries in the livestock industry and so forth. So that's been a big part of what I've done for the HSUS, and it's something that I I believe very strongly and. Um, and I feel like we've made some great progress, but it's very difficult because we have, um, e despite the overwhelming support among most Oregonians to protect all animals from needless cruelty, we have uh, elected officials and uh, wildlife managers who are still very hostile to the idea that, um, that these animals deserve to be protected. And it's the whole paradigm of how uh, of how wildlife is managed. Um, and, and what we are working toward is to achieve a fundamental shift mm -hmm. that reflects how most Oregonians, and I think more and more Americans, frankly, feel about our native carnivores. Um, but unfortunately, right now, um, we have a Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife that really still views its mission as growing as many deer and elk as they possibly can because that is their primary revenue stream. That's how they fund their operations. And so to boost the number of deer and elk available for sport hunters, they have to suppress the number of native carnivores. And they do that through a campaign of, uh, of official hunting, um, of trapping, of using the USDA Wildlife Services, which I know we'll be talking about later, to exterminate vast numbers of animals and really encouraging people who hunt and who, who like to kill animals to go out there and to kill as many of our native carnivores as they possibly can. Again, to boost the number of deer and elk, really treating them almost like free roaming livestock while viewing our native carnivores as pests, as vermin, something to, to be eliminated, to mm -hmm. be exterminated. That's the mentality that we are fighting against. And it's, it's great that we have, I think, most of uh, the Oregon population uh, sort of in alignment with that. But um, unfortunately, that, that sentiment has yet to be reflected in the public policy of our state. Mm -hmm. Um, it, that, that reminds me of something I, I'm often hearing the argument that, uh, that hunters, by paying large fees for the licenses, are actually more invested in the conservation of the thing they want to hunt, let's say the bear or what, I'm sure you have a position on that. Well, what, how would you respond to that? Well, it's really interesting because you often hear the, the sport hunting and the trophy hunting community. Um, you hear this um, in, the, in the, the debate to protect elephants mm -hmm. uh, from trophy hunting and African lions. You hear it um, in the debate over whether Wyoming should, um, they, they've just announced that they're going to allow trophy hunters to kill 23 grizzly bears mm -hmm. right outside of Yellowstone National Park. It's an outrage, and mm -hmm. Americans are outraged, but... Um, but it's, it's a mindset that um, really goes toward um, viewing the predator as, uh, as something to be eliminated. Um, and what we are trying to do is push a perspective that really values these animals uh, as, as important members of the ecosystem. And it's, it's interesting because the trophy hunters and the sport hunters like to say, we should be the ones setting policy for these animals because we're the ones paying into it. Mm -hmm. And yet every time we go before the legislature or the commission and say, give all of us who value wildlife for its own sake a means to get invested, 
a means to pay into the system. Those same sport hunters and trophy hunters are the first to absolutely oppose that because they want to stay in the driver's seat. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, that's sort of the paradigm that we're working about. It's called the North American model of wildlife management. You sell the right to kill animals uh, that are prized and valued as game animals, mostly lived, uh, 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 hoofed animals like deer and elk and bighorn sheep and so forth, and looking at the native carnivores as something to be eliminated. Um, so um, it's, you know, we are working very hard. The Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife has reported a steady decrease in the number of hunters that are going out there into the field to hunt. They are desperate to find new revenue streams and yet still uh, they are resisting, as are their friends in the Oregon legislature, resisting a real sustainable means of allowing all Oregonians to have a say in how all of our wildlife, both the the ungulate populations as well as the carnivore populations are being managed. Tell me what ungulate means, because I don't know. Sure, an ungulate is a hoofed animal. Okay. Um, a, a, a deer or an elk or a bighorn sheep, um, uh, cattle, sheep, dog, or, or goats um, are, all, are all ungulates. Mm -hmm. So as opposed to the carnivores that are, um, so you've got the predators and the prey, uh, the carnivores and the prey, and um, um, the, the ungulates are the ones typically that are the most prized by the hunters. You know, I, I remember, Gay, uh, you and I chatting about this, um, and it was, I think, more in relation to, uh, again, trophy hunting, but in Africa, and saying that a that actually does not contribute to conservation. Um, what Do you have a position on that, just in general, that we can apply? Well, I, I think S Scott would be very eloquent to talk about that. I mean, it, the, it, everything has been convolved, and so conservation and you know, those who are in charge of, quote unquote, the wildlife are killers. Um, I just wanted to make a comment that, you know, when you were talking about um, that the hunters, um, I think someone, I think someone from ODF, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, when I was at a meeting recently said that 80% of their funding came from hunting. Um, and so my question is, well, what's, what's the money for? It's not for the deer, it's for salaries. And so what we see here is a profound conflict of interest. Um, of course, for me, uh, what, what I find most disturbing is that usually this kind of rhetoric is delivered saying that this is science-based, and it's not. It is so out of, it, it is so contradictory and it violates. And we're talking about um, people who have PhDs um, and higher degrees, and they are in charge of policy um, uh, definition and design, and they um, have the ability, because of the way things are set up, to ignore science and to not take into consideration. So this notion of, you know, that we're the people, so someone is supporting conservation through killing is an absolute ridiculous idea. Now the problem is, I think Scott brought that up, is that's the only voice you hear. There really is an attraction point, um, even for science. Um, again, here we get into the psychology. So we have an economic and a social driver which is very, very powerful. That was even in Africa. I remember talking to um, some journalists and some managers said, why are they continuing to kill elephants? You know, this came after, you know, my diagnosis of post-traumatic stress. Now South Africa, by the way, is epidemic with um, PTSD and elephants. You have female elephants killing each other's babies, which is absolutely unheard of. So you're having um, intra-specific fighting, just like we have the violence on our streets and things like that. So I asked this one man, I said, why, why are they continuing to do it economically, blah, 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 down the line? He said, because that's what we've always done. So there's a tremendous amount of um, cultural momentum. And then there is not a really an opening for um, other voices to come in and correct the, the myth and really utilize the science. Because the, all of the science, all of the science, which is very rigorous, says this is the wrong thing to do. I, w I would just add to what Gay is saying by um, the, the, the Oregon Cougar is, in, in my view, a textbook example of this, of, of how uh, bad science is used to mm -hmm. justify the, the, the broad scale killing of these animals. Um, we have long uh, criticized the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife's uh, methods for estimating cougar populations in Oregon because what they do or what they have done historically, is they go to the most cougar-dense region of Oregon, count the cougars, and then extrapolate that statewide. So there are, by their model, 
as many cougars on the streets of downtown Portland as there are in the forests of Jackson County. And, and they can then say, we think that, you know, we believe that there are over 6,000 cougars living in Oregon. They don't have a clue how many cougars are living in Oregon because they're using a flawed population model. But by saying 6,000 cougars, they can create this, this image that there's literally you know, a cougar uh, lurking on every street corner and on every playground just waiting to snatch up our children. That, that sort of fear-driven scientific uh, you know, reality is imposed on the, the public and they use that to justify this sort of war on cougars to, uh, to get rid of as many as they can. Even though Oregon, Oregonian voters twice have stated that they want Oregon cougars protected, not persecuted. Uh, and, and the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife resented that vote. They campaigned against Measure 18. They have told hunters that they are doing everything they can to go around Measure 18. And um, so they're thumbing the nose at, at the overwhelming majority of Oregonians to placate this one very narrow special interest who want to see as few cougars as possible. Mm -hmm. I just want to make a, a quick comment when you are talking about cougars and pumas. Is it's in my my book Carnivore Minds? Biologists who study cougars and pumas have um, agreed with me that they are showing signs of post-traumatic stress disorder. So the cougars, cougars who are carnivores, we're not talking about the sort of soft and fuzzy elephants, are uh -huh. showing the signs and symptoms like we get when veterans and uh, victims and, and survivors of domestic violence and war. And, and, they, and they, they, would, they would say that's a good thing. They want these houndsmen, many of whom are known poachers, to go out there and traumatize these animals with their packs of radio collared hounds. Even if they're not killing them, they want to traumatize them as a means of, in their view, protecting public safety, even though there's never been a single attack of cougars uh, uh, by, by a wild cougar on a human being in Oregon's history. Um, this is a great segue into carnivore minds. I want to talk a little bit more about this. And this is just so wonderful, just this <laughs> flow of conversation. You are both so educated on this particular topic. I feel just very fortunate to be schooled and also help you share your knowledge with the, with the general public. So. This groundbreaking book, Carnivore Minds, Gay, uh, who, Carnivore Minds, who these fearsome animals really are, an introduction to your book says the following. Using the combined lens of natural history, neuroscience, and psychology, G.A. Bradshaw describes how predators share the rainbow of emotions that humans experience, including psychological trauma, Renowned for leading research on post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD in elephants and other species, Bradshaw decries the irrational thinking behind wildlife policies that equate killing carnivores with conservation. In its place, she proposes a new ethical approach to coexistence with the planet's fiercest animals. So tell us about the carnivore mind and how it's different than what is typically thought and why you prefer to call them carnivores rather than predators. Yeah, well, <clears throat> as I mentioned, um, the, you know, I founded this field called Transspecies Psychology, and I only did that because it was to bring awareness that we don't have to look at non-humans, pumas, rattlesnakes, elephants, um, as objects, as ethological or animal behavior. They have minds and emotions just like we do. And so that was it. And also to bring attention to the fact that science is used selectively, as Scott brought up, that what is being presented by the agencies is very bad science. So that was why I did it. But really, to understand is all of science, I know I repeated myself, but this is a very important point. All of rigorous science is based on this notion that pumas and rattlesnakes and rats have the same brains and minds that we do and the same capacities. So The Carnivore Minds, I wrote that book to really break through this, um, this sort of force field of myth that really sh enshrouds um, carnivores. I use carnivores because Predator, I mean, there's even a famous movie, um, you know, with, I forgot, it's not Arnold Schwarzenegger, I can't remember, but, you know, it's just, it's a scary, scary mm -hmm. movie. And so when you say Predator, you automatically get, it's this fearful kind of Someone's thing. Someone's out you know? to get you. Someone's out to yeah. get you, right? And there's a good guy and the bad guy. There's a, bad predator and there's a good prey and things like that. So I use carnivore. Now in the book I, I have a chapter on grizzly bears and bears are 
called carnivores. They belong to carnivora, which is the order, but they're truly omnivores. <laughs> so most of the time they're, they're eating berries and they're eating grass and they're eating roots and then they'll eat you know, some salmon to get fat for hibernation. Um, so that's their lifestyle. Now, as I talk about in the book, you can call uh, you know, a robin or even a whale a predator, but we don't. Right, but they're very much. If you've ever seen a robin, you know, waiting there for the worm to come out, right? So, so predator really is is sort of a obscuring type of, of title, um, and and it's a it's a very interesting thing. And then when you talk to individuals, and that's really the core part of the book. It's based on all the science, but really the the people who know these individual species and animals are not necessarily scientists. Um, this is where we get into human psychology, which is really important. That they're not fearful people. They know themselves. Um, they're very knowledgeable. They are. They know, and they have faith and competence and confidence in themselves. And for that reason, they are able to see. Whereas our training and our education in the universities in wildlife management, again, I don't like the term management because um, it's not our role to manage, <laughs> you know. Um, that's none of our business. And it certainly isn't any kind of political business whatsoever. But um, in contrast, the, all of the science that's in wildlife management and the agency is fear-based. Mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, saber-rattling and it's fear-based. And I think that one of the things which is really important that if we can dispel this whole myth about we're, you know, with all these wild that we're going to be killed any minute, um, and then we get individuals, our, our communities, our, our nation, and around the world as well, to start to have self-confidence, to stop being so fear-driven, then we will not only stop violence towards animals, we will stop violence toward each other. Mm -hmm. So really at the, at the core of it, again, there's the economic and social aspects of the agencies because they profit from it. And the hunters, there's all this kind of um, food chain. <laughs> so not only are the, the hunters' revenues and the fishing revenues, but then they're the people with, um, who sell you know, sports things and guns, and the NRA is is huge in this. In this, uh, and Scott can speak more eloquently about that. So there's all this kind of food chain about people who profit from an industry of killing. And I think you also um, talk about land use and how that uh, impacts these wildlife management policies. Can you elaborate mm -hmm. on that? Yeah, um, basically. Uh, you know, one of the reasons you see cougars and, and pumas in, in Berkeley and in Portland is because they don't have any place to live. Um, they don't have any food. Um, and they, they are constantly, there's um, ATVs, there's even mountain bikes, there's hunters, they have no refuge. Mm -hmm. um, pumas don't like roads, that's, and we have our national forest and BLM are, are cross cut mm -hmm. with these kinds of things. Um, so they don't have food, they don't have any resources. And it's not unique to the carnivores, you see it with the elephants, you see it with every other animal. Mm -hmm. And so what we do is we've basically taken over, just like with um, the you know, Europeans uh, took over American Indian and other tribal peoples. It's the same appropriation. Okay. This is a good, um, let's put a pin in that because I believe we're going to take a quick break and we're going to show a video which gives an example of some of the uh, advocacy that our local Southern Oregon Animal Rights Society does here on the ground in Jackson County. We'll be right back. We're with the Southern Oregon Animal Rights Society, and we're here today in front of the Jordan World Circus at the Expo. It's a fundraiser for the Shriners. We're here protesting the use of exotic and wild animals for entertainment. The elephants are very intelligent and highly social animals. We feel that watching a, a huge animal stand on a ball and perform tricks in no way informs children about what that animal is really like. And in If you think about what needs to go on behind the scenes in order to get those animals to perform in that way, it really will give you pause as to if you really want to spend your money to support that kind of intimidation and fear that goes into the training. If you really want to support the Shriners who do great work, just give them a donation directly rather than use your dollars to support this kind of cruelty. Cecil the Lion. Well, Cecil the Lion. I mean, we, we were talking, um, Gay was talking about 
you know, sort of the, 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 uh, the biases and the prejudices that come to bear, um, especially in an official capacity with regard to ha how we regard uh, these, these carnivores. Um, and I think that the story of Cecil the lion really uh, is a perfect illustration of how social attitudes are changing toward uh, carnivores. Um, and it's also reflected, frankly, in the vote that I, that I referred to back in the 90s by Oregon voters overwhelmingly saying that they don't want bears and cougars in Oregon uh, hunted in a way that is cruel and unsporting. Uh, but then we have this story of this wealthy American who goes to Africa and kills, uh, pays tens of thousands of dollars to kill an animal that is widely beloved in the local community as well as the conservation community around the globe. I mean, he was well known. He had a name. His name was Cecil. Mm -hmm. And what was remarkable about that um, is how when the news hit that this wealthy trophy hunter from the United States had killed this magnificent carnivore, global outrage mm -hmm. was just immense. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and literally, um, that, that trophy hunter is probably one of the most reviled individuals on the entire planet right now. That's pretty remarkable when you think about it, when you realize that just in the last century, uh, you know, I mean, uh, people were going on safari and, you know, they were, you know, killing as many animals as they can. And now, when you see a trophy hunter posing with a dead giraffe mm -hmm. or a dead lion or a dead zebra, or even a dead cougar here in Oregon, or a de dead bear. Um, the outrage is growing. Mm -hmm. it, it is becoming more and more intense. When, when 23 trophy hunters go to Wyoming and kill 23 of our beloved grizzlies, it's going to be amazing, uh, uh, quite an experience for those trophy hunters because they will be heaped with so much scorn, so much outrage. Uh, and that's really remarkable. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, most people see trophy hunting as inherently cruel, as inherently unethical, and it's, it's these kinds of stories that I think are going to inform how uh, we regard these, these, um, these carnivores as well as our interactions with wildlife more generally in the future. Because bodies like the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Fish and Wildlife Commission, I think they're starting to read the writing on the wall. I think they're starting to get how unpopular their, their decisions are where they're just sort of taking care of this one narrow constituency who just loves to kill animals mm -hmm. um, for, for, for no better reason than a, than a trophy. Um, and you know, at, at the last uh, Fish and Wildlife Commission meeting in Baker City, the Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission met. And it was remarkable because the chair of the commission actually called the, the, the staff biologists up and took him to task over the fact that Oregon has some of the worst trap check requirements in the United States. If you are trapping for a coyote, you don't have to check that trap for 30 days. 30 days. That animal, and, and maybe, maybe you've caught a coyote, maybe you've caught someone's dog, maybe you've caught an endangered animal, but you don't, you won't, you don't have to go check for 30 days. And even the chair of the Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission understands that there is a problem with that. Mm -hmm. And yet, you've got this very small but very angry and very vocal minority of trappers in Oregon who pound the table and say that they're doing an ethical thing, that these animals, they're very sensitive about the, the suffering of these animals. Um, but all of the rest of us see what's happening, and it's just, it's obvious. It's obvious that it's cruel, it's a terrible thing to do, it's unethical, um, and now the task is to have our values reflected in the policies set by our legislature and our wildlife commission. Do you think that there is any place for trapping and hunting in conservation? Absolutely not. I mean, because again, the whole paradigm is, is not about, you know, creating an abundance of wild animals. The whole paradigm is about maximizing the number of one animal so that there are more of them for people to kill and suppressing the carnivores that compete. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and of course, uh, it's one thing to set a live trap, you know, for a raccoon because it's in someone's basement or someone's attic and relocating that animal. That's entirely different from setting a steel jawed leg hold trap or a wire neck snare 
to catch whatever you want to catch. And, you know, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, in concert with USDA Wildlife Services, they go out into these target zones with hound dogs, with wire neck snares to kill as to, to kill as many cougars as possible in these target zones to boost the number of deer and elk available to sport hunters. And, you know, thousands of Oregonians wrote the Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission and said, we don't want that target zone approach used. We want cougars protected. And instead of listening to the thousands of Oregonians, they listened to maybe four or five people who wrote in to say that they support it. That's who they went with. They disregarded the overwhelming public opinion and instead are, again, are taking care of this very small minority of people who really enjoy this activity that causes so much suffering and so much cruelty. Mm -hmm. So what, what changes would you like to see Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife implement in order to move towards what really makes more sense ecologically in the whole scheme of things? Well, that, that's, I don't think that's the right question. Okay. I think the right question is um, what do our state's leaders need to do? Because the Fish and Wildlife Commission is appointed by the governor. Mm -hmm. The governor needs to start appointing people to the Fish and Wildlife Commission who believe that animals deserve to be protected. Right now, the deck is stacked against wildlife and it's stacked against the vast majority of Oregonians who want animals protected. Um, and so, you know, th the first thing that needs to happen is people need to contact the governor and let her know mm. that it's time to start putting people on the Fish and Wildlife Commission who represent the values of all Oregonians and not just you know, the, the, the small minority and shrinking minority of people who enjoy going out and killing animals for sport. And how, many, how many members are on the Oregon Commission of Fish and Wildlife? There are, there are nine commissioners. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, there are some, there are some uh, you know, some, some people on the commission who I think try to bring some balance. The chair has, has often said that, that, you know, they need to do more to incorporate the views of, of the non-consumptive uh, population, which of course means those of us who don't like killing animals, mm -hmm. um, we're not consumers of their product, <laughs> right? But but again, it's it, it. There needs to be a fundamental paradigm shift, and and that's only going to happen when uh, you know people continue to um, speak up, speak with their votes, vote for vote for for statewide elected officials who care about animal protection and who will oppose these these policies of eradication. I'm sure you have both heard about killing contests that, you know, some states have implemented where you just try to, you know, make it a, a real, you know, hoot nanny to kill as many coyotes as you can. Um, what can we do to help stop that, especially if it's happening in another state? Well, the, the problem is it's happening here in Oregon. Mm -hmm. uh, there, is, there is a coyote contest, killing contest in Harney County that happens every year. And they, uh, these, these people go out and, and they win prizes if they kill the most coyotes or if they kill the biggest coyote or if they kill the littlest coyote. Um, these are just, uh, it's blood sport. It's killing for the sake of killing. It's killing for the pleasure of killing. And they try and justify it by saying, oh, we're, we're, we're helping livestock producers or we're, we're helping, you know, the deer and the elk. And, you know, Gay can probably speak to this better than I can, but we know that carnivores, um, if, if their numbers are artificially suppressed, they will boost their reproduction rates. Mm. The females will have larger litters. The females will, will come into season at an earlier age. They find ways biologically to adapt. And what, what these killing contests do is they actually cause these carnivores to boost their reproduction rates. So they're very unsustainable. Look, these animals have existed in nature for millions of years. Nature exists in balance. It's, and it's like when, when Gay was talking about, you know, management, you know, like there's some, we have to manage wildlife. Well, the wildlife was doing just fine before the managers came along. So these uh, coyote killing contests, are, is that something that is also sponsored by Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, or what body is kind no, of... No, okay. it's, it's, it's not sponsored by, by the state, but Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife does defend these killing contests by saying that they're not illegal. The coyote is the single most unprotected animal in all of Oregon. You can kill as many as you want using whatever methods you want. There is no bag limit any time of year. Babies, 
mothers, there's no limit. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you can kill them with snares, you can kill them with, with traps, you can kill them with poisons. And there's literally, there is literally no low bar in terms of killing coyotes. And, and so that's what ODFW says. Well, the law says that these are perfectly legal. So yeah, we're not gonna do anything about it because it's perfectly legal under the law. And that's something that I think that we need to change. Uh, the Humane Society of the United States has made a top priority of ending uh, coyote killing contests. There are great groups like Project Coyote uh, that is doing mm -hmm. brilliant work in states like New Mexico to bring an end to these killing contests. And when you look at the people who are engaging in these, con in these contests and you hear the things that they say about coyotes, but also about the people who love wildlife, um, we're not talking about the best element of American society. Mm -hmm. I'll just say that. Um, you are indulging the very worst human impulses by uh, giving prizes for killing the most number of animals. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about USDA Wildlife Services. They kill millions of native animals each year, largely to protect agricultural interests. I know that they have at their disposal many um, tools and strategies that states have outlawed for individuals to use. So, um, you know, are they being reined in at all or what are the efforts to kind of, you know, get some accountability, some transparency and um, get rid of them? Last year in, in Idaho, uh, which is my native state, um, a teenage boy uh, went behind his house, house with his yellow lab um, up onto the hillside uh, and was throwing the ball and he noticed a little device sticking out on the ground that he, out of the ground which he thought was a sprinkler and when he bent down and touched it it blew a cloud of cyanide into his face um, the dog was killed and it was cyanide and that was what's called an m44 cyanide bomb set to kill coyotes uh, set by the United States Department of Agriculture, and that family I just learned just last week has now filed a lawsuit against the federal government, against the USDA, mm -hmm. for that boy's injuries. And in fact, the entire family was uh, contaminated with cyanide, and they all had to be taken to the hospital and treated. Um, USDA Wildlife Services is a rogue federal agency that evades and, uh, and really tries to avoid any sort of public transparency and accountability. They kill millions of wild animals every year using guns, traps, poisons, uh, aerial gunning. They, they are the, the, the guys up in helicopters and airplanes flying around shooting wolves in Idaho, shooting coyotes. Um, they, um, and, and they view themselves uh, as largely untouchable. Uh, they, whenever uh, a dog is killed, there was a, a dog that was uh, caught and killed in some traps up in, in Portland, mm -hmm. and um, their, their statement was, we regret the incidental take of this animal. Not we're sorry that this beloved family member was killed, we regret the incidental take of this animal. So their arrogance and their cruelty uh, cannot be overstated, and they're, you know, they, they have cultivated a culture within their organization of shoot, shovel, and shut up. If, if uh, a USDA Wildlife Services agent finds that they've actually caught someone's dog or finds that they've caught maybe a, an endangered bald eagle, the internal culture says best not to just say anything. Just, just don't say anything because it's just gonna cause us problems. Uh, fortunately, my congressman, Peter DeFazio has made a top priority of going after uh, wildlife mm -hmm. services. He understands how terrible they are, um, and he's working very hard to impose some accountability. But they have very powerful allies, mm -hmm. and they are, uh, you know, they're, um, uh, they they have a, uh, some very powerful interests on their side. Okay, I know that your um, book, Carnivore Minds, also is um, serves a purpose of kind of advocating, of course, for carnivores, not predators, and that would also uh, shed light on really just how terrible U.S. Uh, wildlife Services is. What, what is your opinion of that agency? I know you have familiarity with them as well. Well, if I said something, you would be censored, but I won't <laughs> say it, so. Can we bleep? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, Scott put it very eloquently and, and all. I, I wanted to make a comment, you know, I, I think really when we're looking at these horrendous um, institutions and mindsets that have taken hold. Um, we really need to start thinking about human minds. 
this is a real problem. When you have, um, basically, we have a culture based on killing. I call it killing is proof of life. That's something that's very, very serious. And, and we actually say in our organization that human trauma recovery, human you know, souls <laughs> will, not, uh, will not begin, their recovery will not begin until violence against animals stops. Um, and I, I just think that it's astounding what animals don't do. I, I, I made this little thing about orcas and about animals, and I said, you know, if they have the same brains, the same mind, same capacities that we do, and this is not me saying it, this is all of neurosciences, all of biomedical sciences, if that's the case, then why don't they, you know, commit genocide? Why don't they, um, why didn't they invent guns? You know, why didn't uh, they invent computers? And so, really, the tacit thing is, well, they're, they're not smart enough, right? And that's even been said about tribal people, you know, American Indians. They're primitive. You know, that's not politically correct now, but that's really a tacit kind of thing that this dominating culture was really the smartest. But really, when it comes down to it, in all those cases, their ethics preclude this kind of behavior that is now just absolutely um, gripping our country. And it's, it's spread elsewhere. So I would like to say, and I think it would be very important, for a commission um, to basically be undertaken to, to examine psychologically and psychiatrically these individuals and why they're doing what they're doing. What is happening in their private lives? What is happening in their relationships? Because it's the cycle of violence. You don't just stop with killing animals. You're also doing the same thing in your other relationships. Um, so to me, the, the, this, the, the limelight really should be focused on who are these people? What are they really promulgating? What are they doing to the children? That's another thing. The hunting revenues are going down because there's less interest in it. So now, I think it's ODFNW has started a youth hunt. And that's the children nine years old. And they don't have to have any kind of gun training whatsoever. Mm -hmm. None whatsoever. So essentially, you know, we have something that is really a concern. And, um, and I, I was just thinking also Joni Mitchell's song, you know, you don't know what you got till it's gone. All of these animals are going extinct. The coyote's going to go extinct. The kapuma's going to go extinct. And the grizzly bear. My personal nightmare is waking up and no animals around. Mm -hmm. And I think that we just have to really realize we are in a really precarious situation here. Mm -hmm. And it is a cycle that does need to be broken. And we are not excluded from it. That's what's really important. It's not just nature out there. It's, it, it's inside us now. Well, I certainly personally have the sense that when a trophy hunter takes an animal, whether it be a cougar, or Cecil the lion that they have stolen from me. Mm. Because my interest is that that animal is alive and I don't know why they would get to decide otherwise mm -hmm. when clearly, you know, we all can enjoy that animal in some way, so. Um, I think that's a, that's a very good point. I mean, you know, the, the cougar that the houndsman is chasing through the forest yeah. and harassing and shooting point blank out of the mm -hmm. tree, that cougar belongs every bit as much mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. soccer mom in Lake Oswego as it does to that hound hunter, and yet, that hound hunter is getting all of the consideration mm -hmm. by the wildlife managers mm -hmm. and, and by the, the elected officials who appoint them. Now, your, your book, Carnivore Minds, you mentioned that you did a chapter on um, orcas, and uh, we talked about uh, some of the other animals that you profiled, and one was grizzly bears, and I know that you had some uh, personal stories about grizzly bears that maybe you were going to share with us, and I thought that this would be a good segue. Oh, well, <laughs> you'll get me on that topic. Um, actually, I'm writing a book with Charlie Russell, um, who um, unfortunately passed about six weeks ago. Uh, he was 76. Uh, Charlie uh, grew up in Alberta. He was a pioneer family. And he is, was an extraordinary man. I would say he still is an extraordinary man. And he really um, lived with grizzlies and was able to be with them. He was a very knowledgeable person. I was a very um, sensitive kind of person. And he, um, he and I got together, and I'm the scientist. And what he experienced with bears resonated exactly with very, very fundamental and hardcore science, like I talk about with the neurosciences. And, you know, he would talk about this, and, and he was really, um, he, he's li literally living proof. I'll tell you one story. He went to um, Kamchatka for 10 years, and he wanted to see that was an area that was less impacted by this perennial hunting that goes on here. So he wanted to say, look, 
I know we can live with bears, grizzly bears. They're called brown bears in, in, in Eurasia. Uh, very peacefully, without fear, and with mutual respect. So when he was there, something happened that he didn't expect, and that was um, he was approached to take these young brown bear cubs, grizzly cubs, and reintroduce and rear them and bring them into the wild because their mother had been shot and they were at a zoo. So he did that. And the second year he was there, and he raised 10, and he brought them back. They, he reared them like a, like a mother bear would. They entered um, grizzly bear society, etc. And at one point, um, this mother bear, this huge mother bear, now a grizzly bear or brown bear is about that high, <laughs> and they're a half a ton, right? A thousand pounds. And she had her cubs with her, and she just left. She left her cubs with him and his cubs. And um, that went on for seven years. She had three sets of cubs, and she basically hired him as a bear nanny. <laughs> now, that to me says so much. One, about Charlie, of course, but the second is, look at this bear. Um, look at the, the sensitivity and the, um, the incredible intelligence. I mean, we have this myth about, oh, the worst thing you can run into is a mother bear with her cubs, right? And look at this. She left her cubs there. And, and then it also says, look what we can do if we don't have fear. And Charlie wasn't stupid. Charlie was very knowledgeable. He paid attention. He knew how to live in the wilderness. And that is really what we have to cultivate. So we have to stop the violence because they are traumatized, as you were talking about. And someone who's traumatized, someone who's going to be killed any minute, how are you going to respond? We see that in the PTSD with veterans. So first of all, we have to stop the killing. We have to stop the rubber bullets and the terrorizing. And then the kind of just like a detente is just to start to learn how bears live, mm -hmm. how do the pumas live. Mm -hmm. And they don't really, they don't, they're, they don't, the statistics, that's another myth. There's so many myths. As you said, there's been no wild cougar uh, killings of a human being. And mm -hmm. even if there are, as I cite in my book, um, it's much more dangerous to take a bath in your, in your house. Um, so that's ex extraordinarily exaggerated. So if we can learn just to be, you know, more, less fearful and to be thankful that we live, we have these amazing beings that are around us, we can learn a lot from them, a lot, a lot, how to live, and take that learning of really peacefulness um, into our own species. Well, you mentioned something about how to live in the wild, you know, mm -hmm. in, in a peaceful way, in a not impactful way. And also, if, if folks are living, you know, in a situation where they are raising livestock, there it sounds like that there are alternatives to just killing anything that might threaten your livestock. Mm -hmm. um, there are non-lethal alternatives and effective non-lethal alternatives. Well, for one thing, for, excuse me, but yeah. for one thing, um, the, the number of um, cows that are killed by a puma or a cougar or a bear is negligible. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, they're protecting the cows who are going to be slaughtered. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it's not being nice to the cows or the llamas or whatever. And the other thing is, is that um, this is what Charlie, Charlie was a rancher. You know, he was a rancher for 20 years. And he said, I've never had a grizzly take a cow. And he said, the reason that they do at times is because the ranchers and the uh, farmers have pushed out all the bears, and that's their very rich habitat. Mm -hmm. So when they come out of hibernation, they're starving and they need a big chunk of, of rich food, <laughs> and that's typically a dead bison, historically. Mm -hmm. But because the bison were driven out by the ranchers and the farmers, there isn't that. And so they need to have that in order to survive. Mm -hmm. So Charlie, when there was a cow, when he was a rancher, he stopped ranching because he said he wasn't a very good rancher because he felt bad for the cows. Um, but he, if there was a dead cow, he would leave that dead cow, and that's what the grizzly would do. And there are other ranchers that do that. Mm -hmm. But in a sense, you know, that's another psychological element. Um, you know, this sort of zero tolerance and can't have a cow die. I mean, I, I feel bad for the cow, but the cow's going to go through terrible trauma. You know, they take the babies away from the mothers and they scream and then they're, they're sent off and terrible things happen to them. So, you know, it's this notion of, of just not being control freaks. Mm -hmm. um, it's not our planet. Mm -hmm. You know, we are tiny, tiny, tiny. It is not our planet. And it's our job to learn how to fit in again, which mm -hmm. is what Charlie used to talk about. Are there um, some non-lethal methods that you can talk about when folks are trying to protect livestock and maybe not wanting to offer up a cow, but not wanting to also, you know, engage in a coyote killing contest or take out a wolf. Right, and and the, the humane society uh, stresses 
strongly the idea that non-lethal deterrents are far more effective, uh, not to mention far less uh, controversial than you know just exterminating these these carnivores. So yes, and and I I point as an example to a sheep rancher in central Idaho who I met with who. Uh, runs 10,000 sheep right in the middle of the territory of the biggest pack in all of Idaho and doesn't lose any sheep to them. Why? Because he uses, he does all the things that are proven to work and he does them consistently and uniformly. And he, he reports that every six months that wolf pack sends a lone wolf to the ridge above his ranch. That wolf spends the day watching and then goes back and that happens every six months, and it's almost like the pack is sending a scout to say, is that guy still there? <laughs> you know, yep, he's still there. Okay, well, we better, we better stay away from his sheep. He uses range riders who are, you know, people out on horseback who actually stay with the, the, the livestock and protect them. Dogs, donkeys, llamas, fladery, which are, you know, flapping, you know, colorful flags on, on fences. There are things that work that send a very strong message to the carnivores that this is not your this is not your area this is not this is not uh, you know this is not your your prey source mm -hmm. and you know he says wolves you know think about how smart a dog is okay wolves are exponentially more intelligent than dogs and they learn so much faster um, and and so. You know, people are using non-lethal deterrents very effectively. Unfortunately, there are still those in the livestock industry who view shooting and guns and traps as, as the best way uh, to, to deal with, with this. But those people's values no longer align with the values of, I think, most, most Americans and, and a growing number of people. Uh, we want to see uh, these carnivores protected and we want to see them uh, you know, treated in a way that is respectful and decent. Thank you. I'd like to thank both my guests. This has been excellent, excellent. And um, can folks go to HSUS website to find out more information about yes. some of the things you've chatted about? And then Karula Center also has a website. I would encourage everybody to go to those two resources and uh, find out uh, a little bit more if you want to dig deeper into what we've been talking about. Um, if you'd like to see this program again, you can find it on the RVTV archives. And I also invite our viewers to join us for our monthly radio programs of Animals Matter on KSKQ Radio 89.5 in Ashland, 95.1 in Medford, or live stream at kskq.org. It airs the second Friday of the month at 1 p.m. Uh, again, I'd like to thank my fantastic guests, and I look forward to more interviews. Uh, I'm Alyssa Weaver, and this has been Animals Matter. Thank you.